Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar presentation, Patent Drafting, Trends, Reality, and Avoiding Rejections. I am Gail Martin, Associate Marketing Manager at Reed Tech, and I want to cover a couple of things before we get started. Please feel free to submit questions during the webinar by using the chat or Q&A feature. We will be sending you a copy of the slides and a link to the recording from today's presentation. Now I'd like to introduce today's presenters. Jean Quinn. Jean Quinn is the founder of IP Watchdog, a patent attorney, law professor, and leading commentator on patent law and innovation policy. Todd Van Tomey. Todd is a shareholder in Nymaster Goods Intellectual Property Department. Todd counsels clients on how to avoid intellectual property disputes and resolve them in a cost-effective manner. He has extensive experience drafting and prosecuting patent applications across a wide array of technologies. Cynthia Gilbert. Cynthia is founding partner at Blue Shift IP LLC. Her practice focuses on the strategic development of patent portfolios for a range of computer technology companies in all stages of the invention life cycle. She has developed deep experience across a wide range of technology disciplines. Dave Stitzel. Dave joined LexisNexis in 2015 as a corporate legal client manager and transitioned to LexisNexis IP Solutions as a consultant in 2017. Prior to joining LexisNexis, Dave obtained extensive experience drafting and prosecuting patent applications as a patent attorney. He also has two years experience as a patent examiner with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Thank you again, everyone, for attending today's presentation. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Gene. Okay, thanks a lot, Gail, and thank you all for being here today. <clears throat> Obviously, based on the number of registrations we've had, we've picked a topic that resonates, and I can understand why that is. Uh, specifications have only become more important in recent years, given the rulings from the Federal Circuit, which only ever seem to require more and more disclosure, and then with examiners almost at times seeming to become unreasonable in their interpretation of those Federal Circuit rulings, it seems that gone are the days of cheap patents with thin disclosures forever. So today we're going to have a discussion about 112. It's going to be a wide-ranging discussion. We're going to talk about a whole host of different things. Uh, we're going to start off today with a brief discussion about a tool that can help you ensure adequacy of disclosure. And while this is not going to be a product demonstration and we're not going to have time to go through the nuances of that tool with any kind of a demonstration, we'll give you a, a big picture of what is available out there and discuss the problems that can come up during drafting. And then we're going to pivot into a substantive discussion of 112 issues arising from the case law and in the prosecution of a patent uh, at the Patent Office. And our focus is going to be on drafting and what you need to help ensure that you have disclosures that we're going to stand the test of time and also the test of the Federal Circuit, which is not as easy as it used to be. So with that, what I'd like to do is what I always do at the beginning of these webinars <clears throat> is go around to our panel of experts here one by one and get them to give us their preliminary thoughts on this particular topic. So we'll start here with Todd and then go to Cynthia and Dave. Todd, as we embark upon this um, discussion about the disclosure in 112, what is it that you want people to keep in mind um, here today? Well, Gene, well, thanks for having me. Um, I guess yes, I have a I have couple a takeaways of things I've seen uh, related to 112, and that is I see increasing use by examiners of indefinite, indefiniteness rejections when using terms of degree. Um, I also um, want people to take away that uh, they should seek, uh, or that uh, what I'm seeing from the examiners is that there is um, a need, sometimes in a, I think inappropriately, most of the time inappropriately, for exact language from the specification to be used for uh, written description support uh, for a for in the specification for claim amendment. And then lastly, I'm seeing an increase in the uh, specific call out of claims being interpreted in a means plus function way, even though um, means for is not not invoked, and I think there's a new emphasis there uh, at the patent office in that regard. 
Okay, thanks a lot, Todd. Cynthia, your your preliminary thoughts, and I know we're going to have a lot of time to discuss them, but what do you want people to have in mind right here, right now, as we begin the conversation? Sure thing. Thanks for having me on. Um, I think there are two main points people should consider here. First, the patent examiners and, to a certain extent, the courts are struggling to figure out what the bright line rules are. And I think examiners are just reaching for whatever tool they can get. If it's 112, they're going to use it against us. If it's you know, 103, if it's a different standard for interpretation or examination, they're just doing whatever they can to try and get and get through this time of uncertainty. And the second point I would make is that this can be an opportunity for clients. In fact, our clients should consider this an opportunity to really think through the technical details of what they've invented and not just slap a cover sheet on something just in case it's useful, but, but really think through at, at a technical level, why is this so important to our company? Why should we be writing this up? And that discussion and analysis will have benefit to them on the business side, and it will absolutely improve their, their patent applications and that process for them at the patent office. Okay, well, thank you, Cynthia. Um, Dave, your thoughts? Yeah, sure thing, and thanks for having me, Gene. Uh, what, what I would say is there's definitely, uh, you know, solutions in the marketplace like Patent Optimizer uh, that essentially uh, consistently enable uh, patent practitioners to draft high-quality, well-tailored patent applications with improved efficiency uh, and avoid, you know, these 112 rejections and therefore streamline and, uh, the patent prosecution process and avoid unnecessary prosecution fees. And also, at the end of the day, create a stronger, more defensible patent application and granted patent thereafter. So when you really think about the big picture of, of the financial risks and what are at stake, I mean, you're spending a ton of money for, you know, legal fees when it comes to novelty searches and, and analysis and opinions, the actual costs associated with drafting the application. Uh, every round of uh, prosecution, you're looking at anywhere from $2,700 to $4,600. And then that's not even including the, uh, you know, the exorbitant amount of fees that can be incurred during litigation. So to me, it just makes uh, really good business sense uh, to use a solution like Patent Optimizer where you can, you know, essentially uh, do all of that. And it's obviously quickly becoming, if, if it's not already, the standard in the industry. And, uh, you know, it's being used by law firms as well as top patent organizations. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Dave and Cynthia and Tom, sure. for those preliminary thoughts. And one of the things I, I failed to mention in the in the opening is um, we picked the experts here on this panel today uh, specifically because everybody has a different background and a different um, uh, uh, focus that they bring to this conversation. So we're going to get a, a, a diverse set of opinions based on a, on a wide familiarity of concentrations based on different technologies. So uh, I think that'll be exciting for us as we as we go through and see how things are similar and how they might be different in uh, different areas of technology. So with that, let's go through and start. Dave, can you uh, talk to us just uh, briefly here in a few minutes about what, what it is technology-wise that's available to help patent practitioners in terms of making sure that the specifications that we are submitting are actually adequate in terms of depth and scope so that we don't have problems? Yeah, most definitely. I appreciate that, Gene. So, yeah, my, my portion of the presentation is going to focus first on some specific examples of 112 rejections and related errors. Uh, secondly, we're going to focus on some of the various disadvantages associated therewith. And then thirdly, uh, you know, just a, a brief description as far as our patent drafting solution and how it can help patent practitioners avoid those 112 related rejections, as well as post-grant challenges uh, by consistently satisfying the, you know, the written description and, and uh, definiteness requirements of 112. So the first slide uh, it essentially provides non-limiting examples of errors and anomalies within patent applications that may result in 112 rejections, as well as unenforceable patents. Uh, they include failing to comply with the written description requirement, claim terms lacking proper antecedent basis, for example, like terms having ambiguous antecedent basis, uh, claims that are an improper dependent or improper multiple dependent form, claim language that may be construed as being vague and indefinite, uh, examples of such vague and indefinite language include relative terminology or terms of degree, like relatively large, uh, terms of magnitude or approximation, like about, similar, or type, and subjective terms, like aesthetically pleasing. As discussed in the uh, AIPLA 2017 annual meeting, 112 rejections also frequently arise with functional claiming, where the specification fails to adequately disclose corresponding structure, material, or acts in support thereof that perform or accomplish the claim to function. 
this, uh, in a couple of other instances or situations where you have a drawing uh, set and you have the same part number uh, being used to identify different part names within the specification. And kind of the flip side of that would be different part, uh, excuse me, hearing a little bit of reverb, uh, di different part numbers being used to identify the same part name. Also, uh, situations arise uh, when you have inconsistent conversions between English and metric uh, units of measurement. So these are, you know, just given my patent uh, examiner experience, these are things that a patent, or excuse me, a patent examiner will be uh, looking for when they put their, you know, examination hat on when it comes to 112 issues. So uh, the next slide uh, is essentially outlining the, the 112 rejections and related errors. Uh, the result in many disadvantages, and, and these disadvantages include increased pendency times and unnecessary delays in patent prosecution, increased patent prosecution costs, decreased patent prosecution efficiency, which is detrimental, obviously, in flat rate based fee agreements, delayed receipt of a notice of allowance due to solo 112 rejections. And when I say a, a solo 112 rejection, I'm talking about an office action where the 112 rejection is the only re substantive rejection. Uh, in the office action uh, without the presence of any prior art 102 or 103 rejections. Uh, also, the institution of weak ancillary 103 prior art rejections uh, that may not have otherwise been asserted by the examiner, but for the need to, uh, to address the 112 rejection in an office action. And then, of course, opening the door for prosecution history estoppel uh, based on narrowing amendments as well as corresponding arguments made to overcome those 112 rejections. And then uh, last but not least, uh, weaker and less defensible patents. Um, hold on, I'm sorry, I didn't go to, I clicked on that and it, uh, let me go back. I was, that's, I'm that's sorry if I, I double clicked. Uh, so anyways, last but not least, uh, the weaker and less defensible patents, which are more susceptible to post grant challenges for failing to consistently meet the legal requirements for patentability, uh, including the written description and definiteness requirements of 112. So the the next thing I wanted to mention uh, would I think these slides might be a little bit out of order. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to get to next is, is Patent Optimizer. Uh, it, it is an extremely beneficial and powerful patent application drafting solution, which enables patent practitioners to do a number of things. Uh, some of which I, I touched on earlier at the, at the beginning, including drafting high-quality, well-tailored patent applications with improved efficiency, streamlining not only the patent preparation but also the prosecution process uh, with an eye toward avoiding 112 rejections and related errors, and then, of course, uh, creating stronger, more defensible patents. So uh, by leveraging Patent Optimizer, patent practitioners can generate a report that captures 112 errors present within their draft application prior to filing. Uh, we also identify the presence of claim errors, uh, including instances of a lack of sufficient written description, a lack of proper antecedent basis, improper dependencies, improper multiple dependencies, incorrect status identifiers. Uh, if, for example, if you're working on an amendment, uh, numbering errors, uh, missing claims, and missing periods. Our uh, solution also searches the specification for su uh, sufficient written description. And what's awesome about this is we not only look for explicit literal support, uh, but we also uh, look for similar support like grammatical uh, variations, as well as implicit conceptual support based on our proprietary patent thesaurus. And by leveraging a series of proprietary patent profanity dictionaries, our solution also identifies potentially problematic language by finding terms and phrases that may be construed as being vague and indefinite, functional, impacting claim breadth and scope, invoking public relations concerns and considered offensive. Our solution also identifies means plus function claim language and locates uh, the recital of structure and support thereof within the underlying specification. And what I think is really impressive is we also uh, look, or we also provide suggested um, structural variants uh, uh, and that's being obtained from our US, WIPO, European and, and Canadian patent corpus uh, for possible inclusion in your specification during drafting. So we're providing you with supporting uh, structure that's being mined from across the entire patent corpus uh, to give you a feel for, uh, you know, uh, structure that you may be able to uh, incorporate into your specification. And uh, I would say also that we enable patent practitioners to detect and correct inconsistent conversions between English and metric units of measure. And uh, in addition to identifying in inaccurate and inconsistent part names and numbers, uh, within the drawings and description of your draft application, 
Uh, our solution also provides the ability to auto-generate a part name and number index, uh, which is trem a tremendous time saver when analyzing drawings of cited prior art references during prosecution, uh, as well as asserted patents uh, during pre-litigation and litigation. You can also selectively auto-insert into your draft application specific terms, phrases, and part expressions that are being suggested by the solution uh, up to t from up to 10,000 patent documents. So again, uh, we're providing you with the ability to, you know, essentially import up to 10,000 patent documents, whether it's your own applications that you've drafted or, or maybe from your own uh, client's portfolio or maybe that of a competitor. Uh, but we enable you to select specific terms, phrases, and part expressions from that entire uh, patent um, pool, so to speak, and uh, incorporate those into your drafting process. Uh, patent practitioners can also review the quality of an asserted patent uh, or a patent that is being considered for assertion by identifying the presence of fatal 112 errors, which may not have been addressed during prosecution but may nevertheless render the claims unenforceable. Please feel free to contact me if you're interested in a personal demonstration of our patent drafting tools. I would be happy to facilitate the same. And I'll go ahead and pass it over to Gene. Okay, thanks a lot, Dave. Now there's a lot there. Sure. And now what we need to do is we need to unpack this. Because the reason that Patent Optimizer becomes such an important tool and so many people are using it is because so many of these problems, which once upon a time were things that, you know, were problems, I suppose, you know, and we've always learned sufficiency of disclosure is important and stay away from patent profanity. But now with these decisions that have come up and the way the Patent Office is treating these things, they are all the more important with patents that are dying, it seems like, almost daily. Now, one of the things I want to cover, and I'll just take these next few slides myself and then ask the, the rest of the panel for some comments on it, because this is more informational and I just want everybody to know about it, because when I learned of this, I didn't know about it. I was talking to other people in the area in, uh, who watch the Patent Office very closely, and they were unfamiliar with this as well. But the Patent Office does not follow Nautilus. Um, so this slide reminds us what the Nautilus decision was about. It was about doing away with the insolubly ambiguous standard for indefiniteness that the Federal Circuit had adopted with respect to 112. And um, the, the Supreme Court was very troubled with that and thought that that standard would lead to some claims that were ambiguous being okay and some claims that were ambiguous not being okay. So they did away with it and came out with a reasonable certainty standard, uh, which you know seems to me to make an awful lot of sense. Um, so that's the Nautilus case in a giant nutshell. There's obviously a lot more that could be said about that. But the USPTO doesn't follow Nautilus, and this became um, clear to me back in, uh, a while ago at the end of last year and when the PTAB in Telebrands versus Tennis Enterprises, in their decision, explained that they were not going to follow Nautilus. And they said that we do not understand Nautilus to mandate the board's approach to indefiniteness. Um, because in their opinion, Nautilus was about litigation and um, everything the Patent Office does is not litigation. So they decided that they don't have to follow Nautilus, that they continue to follow In Ray Packard. And In Ray Packard has a very different standard uh, in, in that test. And to some extent, it looks a lot closer to me to the insolubly ambiguous standard than it does to the standard in, uh, announced in Nautilus. Then in, um, um, did I go forward too many slides? Okay, no, I'm sorry. Then in Ex parte McWard in August of 2017, in a decision made precedential at the PTAB, they specifically, uh, now it is the policy of the PTAB that they no longer follow Nautilus. Um, that they follow Packard. So it was not just that one off PTAB decision. This is now the policy of the PTAB in general that they are to follow the Packard decision where a claim is indefinite when it contains words or phrases whose meaning is unclear. And put differently, claims are required to be cast in clear as opposed to ambiguous, vague, or indefinite terms. Now, 
whether that standard is terribly different or not, the Patent Office views this standard as more restrictive than the Nautilus standard. That's what they've said, and they filed a brief to the Federal Circuit actually in the Tinius case, in the Telebrands case. So it is not just the PTAB standard, it is now the Solicitor's Office that is taking the position for the entire Patent Office that they don't follow Nautilus. So uh, I don't know whether this is particularly actionable information or interesting information, but I do think it is something that the patent bar needs to know. Uh, Todd, do you have any thoughts? Cynthia, do you, you have any thoughts? Will Todd go to you first, Cynthia, you, and F. Um, not a whole heck of a lot, Gene, but I will make the following comment. I think this does play into uh, some of the things that I've seen recently, which is the terms that were uh, the about substantially, those type of terms, have increasingly been uh, cast as indefinite in, in my experience. And the examiners are almost requiring an exact numerical endpoint, for example. And I'm going to submit to you, I don't think that's required as long as one of ordinary skill would understand the meets and bounds of that, of that claim limitation. So maybe there's some situations where it would be appropriate, but the vast majority of cases that I've experienced in uh, in the past where it was completely appropriate are uh, are uh, now becoming uh, ripe for rejection. Cynthia, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I think it's clear they're giving the Patent Office a very wide <laughs> flexibility and, and letting them pretty much do whatever they think is appropriate instead of having a very confined uh, take on 112, which can can cause some some frustrations, I think, as, as Todd's pointing out. But um, I think the the take home message is here: the patent office is allowed to do this stuff for now until they do something differently at the uh, the upper court level, and we should just bear that in mind. The patent office has, has a wide wide flexibility. Yeah, you know, and and now I'm going to cascade here for for a minute, and <clears throat> some of the courts are now in the venue area saying that if you did not bring up a challenge to venue, um, you are now stopped from raising a venue challenge because the law in TC Heartland did not change because it was always supposed to have been the law. Um, because the Supreme Court really just said that Forco Glass always remained the law and the Federal Circuit got it wrong. So, I mean, the one thing that I would think about is, is well, it doesn't seem like we're going to have any real ability to affect what the patent office is going to do. They're going to apply in Ray Packard. If you think that this matters, I would encourage people to raise it and not forget about it and, and, and not um, mention it, at least in, in briefs or appeals or, or what have you, because there is maybe a waiver argument that could come up later on, and you might be stopped if and when uh, everything gets undone. Um, so that's just something to think about. Uh, so that's I do why see I, that there was there was a question raised earlier asking whether there will be more concrete 112 requirements in the MPEP based on tech areas. Yeah. And and I my guess is that that's not coming for a long time. And if we had clear bright line rules, we wouldn't see the patent office grasping at straws to apply 101 and and the uh, the rejections on that side. So my my take on it would be not likely. Um, wonder if you guys think have anything else to add to that. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I, I, I think that we're probably not going to see any requirements specifically for examples and specifications or, or things of that nature. I mean, because the Patent Office, particularly in the MPEP, follows very closely what the courts are saying. I don't see the courts saying that, and I see this whole area is really just kind of messy and mushy at the moment. Todd, what do you think? Any thoughts? Um, I I agree. I don't think we're going to see any uh, clarity in the MPEP anytime soon for the reasons already stated. Okay. So let's go on to the next slide. And Todd, this is this is your slide, and it's got a number of bullet points that I know we specifically want to cover, and that we uh, mentioned that we were going to talk about during um, in the registration text uh, that people saw when they were signing up here. Do you want to uh, take this slide away and, and give us a little uh, discussion about what you have here? Yeah, sure. sure. So, so um, um, in giving some thought to the presentation today, I, I came up with a few uh, bullet points here to discuss um, and at least consider. Um, some of the things, like I've already 
you discussed already that I've seen in my practice are a lot of uh, 112 rejections on terms, for example, about or substantially or something like this, relative terms that in the past would have um, not been the subject matter of a rejection. Um, so what I've done is I've started considering, at least in conversations with clients, defining those terms of degree. I haven't really done that very much yet. Um, or uh, more significantly, including uh, alternative numerical ranges or limitations for the amounts of ingredients or components in a, in a, a claimed system, uh, and then specifically doing talking to clients about um, have they done experimental work across the range? Um, is there a significant drop off? Where does the range actually begin and and uh, and end? Um, so, in, in in doing so, I guess it leads into the second bullet point. Well, hold on before um, we go. Um, yeah, before yeah. we go there, I want to specifically because when we, you and I we were talking about this leading up to the call, um, there was something that you know, I, and I don't deal. I know you deal with food science and mm -hmm. that, that's that area. And that's not an area that I've ever really worked in. But we were talking about uh, food products and the difference between how you might describe the food product to consumers in terms of the consistency um, and what might be desirable from a marketing perspective and how oh, you yeah. describe the patent application. And I found that personally fascinating, and I think others would as well. Could you give us a little insight there? Sure. So, so in – in my area of practice, especially in food science, uh, clients want to talk about, um, I guess I'd, I'd conceptualize it like this, they want to claim the benefit. So if something is a moist core after microwaving or something for this example, that might be the benefit. And that's uh, interesting to uh, put in the patent application, but, uh, you know, it, probably not going to get, uh, get past the... Um, many uh, of this type of rejections nowadays. So what you need to do is have a conversation, or what I've started doing is have conversations with, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm getting an echo. Um, so what I've started to do is have conversations with clients about um, what what's the feature of the invention? What's the actual technical uh, feature that is providing that benefit and trying to really drill down and give a lot more detail uh, about uh, sort of the the technical feature that is providing that benefit and really trying to define um, where that comes from. And then not only where it comes from, but then, okay, how are we going to measure it? And how are we going to, do we need to establish our own uh, test or uh, what do we need to do to describe it adequately so that uh, it can pass muster under 112? So when you're doing that for like whether it's moist on the inside or I think what we talked about is, is you really have to go through and do the experiment and be able to put numbers to this. And then if you don't do that, then the client has to make a choice. Am I going to file or am I not going to file? And sometimes they still decide to go forward and file, right? Sometimes they do, absolutely. Uh, obviously, if you can quantify that, and that's kind of what I'm trying to get at of how you measure things at the end, um, that would obviously be the best. Uh, the other thing, uh, I have conversations with clients, and if they don't have the experimental evidence or the resources to conduct further experimental evidence that will help us drive to that, um, one of the things that I sometimes discuss with clients is whether or not they're going to file uh, the application anywhere other than the United States. And if they're not, in the food science area, lots of times the invention may be amenable to uh, trade secret protection. So we could file the application in the United States with a non-publication request and and treat it like a, like a trade secret in the interim, too. So that's something also to consider. Mm -hmm. Now, Cynthia, let me loop you in here in this discussion, too, because I know you focus on software in the electronic arts. And I know a lot of times in, in that space, 112 is a real issue, and you get 112 and 101, and a lot of times I think they really overlap, right? I mean, if you have 112 support for a real invention, that goes a long way to, to getting you past the 101 hurdle, doesn't it? It does, absolutely. And I, I think one thing that's interesting about the, the trade secret idea that, that was just raised is that it's really hard on the software side. 
I mean, a lot of times there's a user interface, so you're going to let people access it or download it or or really play around with, with the invention uh, because that's what you want your consumers doing. Uh, and so so it's kind of interesting there's another technology area where that's a great idea, um, but that's a struggle on the, the software side a lot of times. So yeah, if you can if you can pay attention, a lot of these bullet points really do apply on the on the software side. If you have evidence, if you've actually implemented it, sometimes clients will say, "Well, we'll we'll just code that up." <laughs> yeah, but how is the question? And a lot of these points is really getting to what are those surprising, unexpected properties? What are the elements that are actually going to execute this? How are you in particular going to pull that off? Where are you getting that data? What are you storing it in? And and so getting through the 112. Yeah, questions is often very helpful for nailing down the 101 approach. Yeah, you know, and I always try and tell people, because I do, or I used to do a lot of software, now I do a lot less practice than I, than I used to do, uh, but what I, I always used to try and tell people is with software, innovation resides at the, at the intersection of Murphy's Law, right? You know, if you were yeah. really describing your invention so it goes from A to B to C to D in, in this kind of linear fashion, it's probably really not an invention, and on top of that, it's probably really not going to work because mm -hmm. it's got to be a system, and any system has to assume that it's going to have human interaction that is going to try and break this, maybe not intentionally, but increasingly now with uh, ID theft and all the kind of security problems that you have, um, a lot of times these things are written up without any appreciation of the real-world environment, and that, to me, is a 112 issue. Yeah, and in some ways, the flip side of that is you'll find your real innovation in the areas that where that address what happens when this goes wrong, when this doesn't do what you expected it to do from A to B, then that's where you've got a hook. That's exactly right. Now, Todd, is that also what you find in in the food science, particularly? I know you do mechanical stuff, and when we get to that, we have some bullet points here. But is that really also where the innovation often rely, resides and why you need to go through and do these experiments? Because when you do it, sometimes you really are shocked. Yeah, that's yeah. where sort of the uh, ascertaining and highlighting the surprise and unexpected result uh, properties of the claimed invention comes along in bullet point number three here. Um, and I guess it sort of ties into, uh, um, I guess what I would also consider doing lots of times in my experience in food science, the inventor's own work is the closest prior art. And if that's the case, um, even further beneficial um, data to include might be uh, comparative examples of the inventor's prior work. Um, you have to be a little careful with how you do that, but show how uh, the unexpected results happen and compare, compare the two. Um, like I say, lots of times it's uh, you know, the other other people, other applicants' prior art um, might be relevant, but usually the inventor is uh, working in the exact same area and may have stumbled across a, uh, an improvement like that. Mm -hmm. okay. Gene, I see so a question I on here asking for more clarity on how 112 can tie in with 101. And I'd just like to comment that the more specificity, the more technical effect you can be describing, the less likely it is that the examiner can use these 112 weaknesses to argue there's an abstract idea. If you've got you know, a particular component with particular definitions and functionality, and that's all very clearly laid out, and you've identified alternatives, you really take on a lot of steps technically speaking, um, to, to walk back from the, the abstract argument. Yeah, no doubt. Now, Todd, I didn't mean to um, sidetrack you before, and I wanted to let you get back on track here, because um, I know, uh, do you want to jump in here at the mechanical piece, or is there more to say about some of these other things? Oh, no, actually, storytelling, what am I doing? That's one of the big pieces I wanted to get at. Can you tell us more about what you have there, please? Sure. Um, um, during during my career, I, I, I have kind of fluctuated from, at the very beginning, there was an emphasis on sort of traditional drafting of tell the story in the background and then the solution and the detailed description. Um, we've kind of gotten away from some of that. We don't you know, limited sort of the background to 
a very scant few sentences in some situations, but um, there may be some benefit of talking about um, and highlighting the um, solution with uh, respect to the problem that was before uh, the, the inventor in, in the uh, inception of the invention uh, in the sense that it helps you tell the story to the examiner in a food science or chemical case and saying and establishing sort of this surprising and unexpected properties um, as you make your argument for patentability of the claims. So I've started to expand a little bit of the background um, where the case is appropriate and and describe um, how the application came about to being. And I found it helpful. Yeah, I mean, that can, and, and that's one of those things that when you get these absolute rules, they're absolutely wrong if you apply them absolutely. <laughs> you know, <laughs> none of these absolute rules fit 100% of the time, you know, and I, and even before, and we, we just talked about this in the, in the pre call here. Um, even before KSR, there was always this no good deed goes unpunished. Say as little as you have to say, you know, you should be given Miranda warnings before you file an application, right? Because anything exactly, you say exactly. can and will be used against you. Then KSR comes out, and it's like, see, we told you all along, what you do say is going to lead to obviousness. So now some companies come up with rules, limited number of words in the background. But that isn't always the right way to go. I mean, if you can't explain what the innovation and why it is really an innovation, uh, certainly in the software space, you're in trouble. And, and that sounds to be what you're also saying you're seeing in, in the industries you operate in, too, Todd. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you can do it somewhat in, uh, you know, declaration evidence after the filing and things, but I think it adds a little bit more if it's in the background at the inception when you're explaining to the examiner, when you're quoting the application as opposed to relying on a declaration uh, provided by, by someone. Mm -hmm. Now, Cynthia, what, what are you doing in the background now? I mean, like particularly maybe post NFISH, which it really looks for the innovation, and if you're not really articulating what the innovation is, you've got a, a long road in front of you. Yeah, we're we're definitely still cautious about what we say in the background itself and, and anything that can be described as as the background section or anything like that. But we're doing a lot more of, of laying out the problem and the solution, almost taking a European approach to things and saying, in some embodiments we've got something here that's gonna solve this technical problem and we're we're thinking of this in terms of how do we prove this isn't long standing. And we're we're identifying these components or these and now analytical properties or these functions are not in the existing, you know, ecosystem. And here's the particular problem that, that we're solving because we have that functionality available. So we're, we're addressing that, but not necessarily by, by having a lengthy background. Right, right. So you do have, we have a question as to what are the downsides for doing this later on in, in, in you know, and it's, this is really a catch 2022 20, and I think it's hard to talk about these things in, in generalities. I think what you want to do, my, in my own personal view, is you don't go into these things with any kind of preconceived, absolute, you can never do X, Y, and Z. But the general rules apply for a reason. You know, you generally don't want to have long and wordy backgrounds. That, that's, that rule is there for a reason. Uh, and I think if you're going to violate that rule, you need to convince yourself that there's a sensible reason to do that. And I think that that's sort of also true in when, whenever you make any kind of positive statements about uh, the solution or characterizing the innovation because all those things can come back to haunt you. But at the end of the day, if you're not going to be able to get the patent unless you do that, then the litigators are never going to have anything to argue about anyway. That's exactly right. I think you're exactly yeah. right, Gene. I think in my practice, what is really helpful along lines, what you're saying, is really work with the client to identify where is the invention. Is it in a particular combination of things, a particular amount of something, and or maybe it's more than one concept, obviously. But if you can really work on defining um, the meets and the bounds uh, from from the inception, it helps later on. 
Okay, Todd, can you tell us a little bit about your last point here? Because that leads us into uh, the next slide after this here. Sure, the, on the means four? Yeah, please. Sure, I mean, I've seen um, much more uh, uh, characterization on the record of, uh, I guess, what would have been considered, potentially considered more structural limitations in the past and being called out as being interpreted under 112 paragraph 6. Um, for example, um, whatever a air moving device um, might might be uh, interpreted under 112 uh, paragraph 6 and really it's referring to a fan, for example, in the specification. Um, that is now being called out specifically in office actions that I'm seeing as being interpreted under 112 paragraph 6. And all I'm suggesting is um, if you're going to include uh, something like that, uh, that doesn't have a lot of structure to it, um, it may be beneficial, even in mechanical cases, to go through and have a conversation about each element of the device and say, okay, can this be done in a different way by a different uh, mechanical mechanism so that we can be sure to include it in an application similar to what I would do in related chemical arts, right? Um, but make sure we do that or and or be cognizant of the fact that you, you might get an interpretation by the patent office even on the record that that's going to be a 112 paragraph 6. Yeah, yeah, and that, um, well, and that sort of leads us into this, this next slide here on means plus function, which is just to really a reminder um, that, and this is an excerpt from an art, some article, an article that I'm going to be publishing next week on IP Watchdog, which is I've updated, I published several years ago a primer on means plus function, which was getting long in the tooth and really, really needed to be updated. So I've gone and I've updated that, and that will be publishing next week. And it just remember, you know, if you're using means language, there's a presumption you're invoking 112F. If you're not using means language, there's a strong presumption that you're not invoking 112F. But then, of course, always remember that in Williamson, the Federal Circuit said that, that they're not going to be tied to any of those uh, form over substance rules, that the real focus has to be on whether the words of the claim are understood by ordinary persons of skill in the art to have sufficiently definite meaning as to the name for structure. So you, are, you, are you claiming structure or are you not claiming structure? So. Things have gotten a lot more complicated in, in recent years, I, I think, with means plus function, which is one of the reasons why you really have to pay particular attention because just because you're not using means language doesn't mean you aren't going to be found to have invoked 112, which then will limit you. Um, Cynthia, thoughts on that? I mean, because this comes up maybe um, – not only, but it does come up certainly a lot or can come up in the in the software area. Yeah, I haven't seen too much of this particular issue, but it's certainly something I, I go over with clients all the time and say, okay, well, you, you've told me you've got an engine for doing this, but but you, you haven't given me any details on it. You haven't laid out any functionality. You haven't provided any real specificity in there. And so let's really dig into what is it that, that you've invented? How, how did you come up with that engine? What is it? Because it's going to be so clear to some, some court, you know, a decade out that that's really easy to knock down by saying it's, it's a means for doing this. So we, we talk about it, but I haven't seen it come up in an examination or anything like that in a large portion of my cases yet. Todd, any thoughts on on means or means for or means yeah, I, I'll, I'll just I'll just reiterate that um, I think the patent office is putting an emphasis on this. I even attended a seminar recently where someone from the patent office uh, spoke, and they provided a slide where they're giving training to inventor. Or I'm sorry, examiners on um, trigger words essentially, so system, uh, device, things like this to have them really critically look at some of those type of things um, to make sure that they are or are not properly applied under 112 paragraph 6. So I think it's a, it's a new area of emphasis for, the, for them. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it is a, a definitely a new area of emphasis. Um, and it's understandable in light of the Federal Circuit cases, you know. Uh, and it's an area, unfortunately, and this is one of the frustrating things, and not only with this area of specifications in 112, but all of patent law 
is it's getting more complicated. It's getting less bright line rule oriented. Thank you to the Supreme Court for that. And we have over 8,000 patent examiners and most of them aren't lawyers. And I think that in and of itself describes why we're getting a lot of disparate treatment uh, with from examiners who are just applying things very differently than one another, and it's frustrating. I, I don't have a good answer there, but it, you know, it's what we are all feeling and we're all seeing. I mean, I've I've seen it. I'm assuming you guys are too. Are are you seeing that, Todd, Cynthia? Absolutely. Yeah, we're seeing so, it sl slightly more than we would have before. Yeah. So now, Cynthia, yeah. um, we have the next few slides are taken from an article that you and your partner wrote for us uh, about six weeks ago that we published on IP Watchdog. And this first slide just talks about, you know, the changing landscape that probably everybody here is really familiar with. The ALICE decision, the KSR, the PTAB, appeals are expensive and slow, and you really need to change the way you're, you're doing prosecution. And when you do that, um, and you start with the first patent application, things can be different. And, uh, and I'll leave you here to discuss what you guys are doing with your first patent application that has led to some success. Yeah, just one point on the previous slide is that this is really pointing out to a trend that, as you mentioned, there are fewer and fewer of these bright line rules. And it used to be very clear, is there a machine? Is there a transformation? Is there a specific test that's easy for an examiner to apply? And those are being eradicated. So everything that we talk about going forward is really just trying to, to give us as much flexibility as we can as more rules change and shift and evolve over time. It's not impossible that we'll get new bright line rules a few years out, but you have to write your application now trying to, to keep that in, uh, that hopeful outlook in mind, but also address the lack of those rules right now. So that's a, the trend we see in, in the landscape right there. And then that first application, I would say that you really do need to think about this from the point of even a provisional application. I know, especially on, for smaller companies, they tend to think of provisionals as, a, as an easy way out of having to deal with a lot of expenses and lawyers and all of that. But I've actually seen more examiners reading provisional applications, which I know is their job, but it's a little scandalous um, because they, they never used to do that. And so we really do mean that first patent application and thinking about all of the different entities that will be reading this, an examiner in three years, an examiner in 10 years, the lawyer buddies of the, the people that might do business deals with the applicant. Anyone reading this needs to, to be able to understand that, that the applicant has put forth some great rationales for addressing abstract ideas, for addressing the low-hanging fruit of 112. Did you check your antecedent basis? Like really, from the very simple clarity rejections, from very simple 112 issues to the more complex and nuanced ones that we've been discussing, it's having that mindset from the first day is very important. And so we really bring this cohesive, like 20-year view to the very first day. And, and I think a lot of, especially smaller companies, Inventors tend to think you're filing an application as if you were filling out, you know, a 1040 EZ tax form and really trying to lay out here. Now, this is the foundation for, for conversations that are going to try and keep up with shifting laws and trying to educate examiners and really trying to serve you, the applicant, for, for a really long time. So that's what we're, we're focusing on and, and explaining to clients how being very specific and narrow and focused in the first instance of claims can provide enormous benefits in terms of getting through the examiner's first view, but also providing support for those broader, longer-term commercial products that um, that people might be thinking of. So, so we always ask, what is it you're releasing in your next quarter? But what's on the wish list for a few years down the road? Or if you got more funding, what would you do to this product today? and helping clients from a very pragmatic perspective avoid all the kinds of issues we've been talking about. I, my, my supposition is that Todd deals with, with all of these issues as well. This is not software specific. Um, although Todd, if you had anything you wanted to, to chime in on on your side of things. No, okay. Okay, so we'll uh, go to the next slide. Uh, the benefits of this strategy. 
Right, and right. and I think a lot of times, lot of times it used to be the case that you could file something very broad in your claims and then work with the examiner to narrow it down and, and come to something rational. I would say you write the broad claim now, but you don't file that. You file something very narrow and specific and show the examiner you're trying to address all of the concerns that they've got, and then you can fight for the broader claims in your continuations and your related applications down the road and really try and get that first patent through um, in a way that is useful to the client very quickly. Uh, I've had a lot of examiners look at claims and say to me, look, I just have to issue this 101. I just have to give you this 112. I just have to, whatever the, the message of the day seems to be, and if we can point to them that we have a very specific claim that we're going for, that there's something the client's actually using commercially, and we can really collaborate with the examiner on how to get them past what they're being asked to do with limited time and resources on their side, that is all very, very useful in, in getting through to the examiner and getting these patents to move forward. Um, it seems to us that, that the broad claims don't do anything other than that antagonize the examiner. Yeah, and you know what I would say with that too is, is particularly when you're dealing in the software space, if right now method claims are clearly disfavored. I mean, in the, I think they clearly contaminate all the other claims you're going to be looking for and I really think you're doing yourself a disservice if you're if those are the first claims you're going after when there's so many other things you could be trying to patent and other claiming techniques you could be you could be using um, and even in the software space with means plus function which is quite limited in software because of the, the algorithm cases um, you know if you if you really have worry about trying to get uh, pass 101 with what you're doing, a great way might be to pull in the tech from the spec with a means plus function claim. Now, I'm not suggesting you use only means plus function claims, and I understand what it means to say to use any. That means your specification has got to be very thick, and 100% of the algorithms have to be disclosed. But if you're not doing that already, I think you really, really are, are, are at a disservice, doing a disservice. Um, because that's where I think we're headed. I mean, do you, do you sense that, Cynthia? I mean, gone are the days when these things, if there were, ever were days when software patents could be obtained cheaply, they're gone, right? Well, that is certainly true. I, I think that this is, your earlier point is a question of, of technology, right? In some cases, they will have come up with a new driver, hook, component thing that they actually can create a solid system around. In some cases, they will have the, the real meaty description of their means plus function. And in some cases, what they have is a method. Right. Now, they have to think pretty carefully about whether that method is worth pursuing. But you've got to choose wisely based on, on what the, the technology there is. And, and choosing wisely gets to your second point, which is that that's all very expensive. You really want someone helping you out who can help you figure out what's the right approach for this technology. And, and that can change from, from one product to another, even within the same company. So it's yeah. definitely more of a challenge than, than it might have been previously. Right, that's right. Now, we may also uh, just be romanticizing that, because I remember a lot of, of the sky is falling kind of blog posts around the KSR decision. So well, you we, know, uh, I, I was just at um, an event in Chicago earlier this week, and an older attorney came up to me and he says, you know, all these young youngsters are running around like this is crazy, and he says, you know, this is what we went through in the 70s, yeah. when after Gottschalk versus Benson, and you just had to really focus on the computer, and mm -hmm. and he said people who are understand that are are going to be okay. Now, obviously, that raises all kinds of problems about the legacy stuff that was written before this became the new reality, but. His, his message to me was, and something that I've been trying to get people to hear too, so I was, amen, is you got to go back and look at what attorneys were doing in the 70s because the, there's going to be some important clues there, uh, particularly in the software space. And it all comes back to a very well-written specification at, at the end. And that, if, you, if you can do that and follow all the suggestions you were just laying and then go back for more, that's, that's the key. Absolutely, absolutely. So the last slide that we have here, Todd, um, 
this was uh, a, a final suggestion that, that you had, I think, to remind people of some other creative ways to use the technology tools that are out there. You want to you want to mention this? Sure. I mean, sure. patent optimizer was already discussed, but it's something that we use periodically throughout the process. Obviously, when you file the application, we try and do it with every response we file, uh, and at least check for uh, antecedent basis issues, the basic things that that you want to make sure that don't don't get missed. And so, as a as a matter of practice, we we try and um, run a patent optimizer report at least on an antecedent basis portions of what's in the claims and how they may have been amended um, prior prior to paying the issue fee to to check and see if there are any issues um, and uh, and and address them um, before the patent issues. I'd like to add uh, something to that as well, if you don't mind. Sure, go ahead, Dave. I was just going to mention, you know, you know, examiners are under tremendous uh, time constraints as well, and you know, quite honestly, uh, I've ran uh, patent optimizer against granted patents, and they're just riddled with 112 issues. And I, I think Todd makes a great point that you know it's a great idea not only to implement and leverage the solution prior to filing, but also do so before you know p uh, paying your issue fees. And, and the reason being is that at the end of the day, you know, we're all human, and, and there's chances for for overlooking certain uh, you know, deficiencies within the spec, and at the end of the day, you want to make sure you have a patent that's going to be worth the paper it's written on, and uh, it's just a great way to address those 112s, uh, you know, prior to grant, uh, so that you can survive those post-grant challenges. Yeah, and you know, that's become more and more important, because um, certainly this is something that uh, our friends in pharma have done forever, right? You know, because if they're going to get a blockbuster drug, they're going to need to, to make sure that patent is in tip-top shape because the money that it's going to create as long as the patent remains in, in effect. Um, but now it, it's true for, for anything that's commercially valuable. It seems that anything that's commercially valuable is going to be challenged at the PTAB. That's just the new reality that we live in. Um, and if there's ways to make sure that there are mistakes found up to and including the time of the payment of the issue fee, I think you, we really need to take that more seriously and do what our pharma friends have been doing all along, which is checking and cross-checking and rechecking and making sure. Um, and so there's tools out there that now make it really much more easy to, to do and, uh, or, you know, at least it's never going to take away the human element, but it, it facilitates it for sure. So, uh, and that that's our our, our last substantive slide. We have some some, some questions here. Uh, I'll try and get to a couple of these before we we break. The, the one question here uh, asks: In what context could you imagine uh, trying to force the patent office to begin applying the Nautilus decision instead of In Ray Packard? And I can't imagine any particular context. Uh, where that would be the case, really, where you could force the patent office to change their policy. They seem to have really dug in on this, and I think it's going to require the Federal Circuit to tell them that uh, Packard is not the right test, or perhaps maybe the Supreme Court to tell the Federal Circuit to tell the patent office that Packard is not the right test. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Todd, Cynthia, do you have any thoughts on, on that? I mean, I can't imagine getting the patent office to change their stated position on that. I don't know I why can't. they would be the least bit amenable to that coming, hearing that from an applicant, for sure. I think they're yeah, going to they hear wouldn't. from somebody pretty far up the chain. Yeah, yeah, no. I think um, they're pretty well set. Yeah. Now, we have a question here, and I think that this relates to when we were talking about means plus function. Have you ever seen, quote, step four, uh, asserted for method claims in litigation, and I think what that's meaning is, have, have we ever seen an have you ever seen an issue where step four has uh, implicated means treatment with a method claim? Hmm. Not off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in the same boat there. You know, I have a vague memory that there was a case once upon a time where. Um, comprising the, the steps four may have been interpreted differently than just 
the transition comprising, but I'm drawing a blank on the name of that case and at what level that case was at. Um, and certainly it's not something that comes up with any kind of real regularity, but I do have that in the back of my head and I can't remember exactly why, but uh, so there, that it's either a case or it's something that's apocryphal and well known or something and I wish I could say more and I apologize. We had somebody that mentioned it would be great to have the trigger words list that Todd mentioned. What I will say is we tried to get permission to, to get use that list and get that slide and we had unfortunately we're unable to get that slide. But Dave, I think you have some information on where people can get that a list, of, uh, maybe not that same list, but a list. Yes, that's right. Um, I, I was actually uh, pulled that pulled this up when the question came in. But uh, if you go to the supplementary examination guidelines for determining compliance with 35 USC 112 and for treatment of related issues and patent applications, it's uh, it's found in, in 76 FR. Uh, 7162, but uh, there's a section in there, and that was published on February 9th of 2011, but there's a section in there uh, dealing specifically with that question of examples of claim terms other than means for uh, language that may invoke 112.6, and some of those uh, key terms are, are mechanism. Uh, Todd, I think, uh, spoke to a couple of these as well, but just some, some uh, you know, non-limiting examples that would include mechanism, member, element, circuit and circuitry, detector and assembly. Okay, and that brings us to the hour. So the last thing that we have here is just if you guys, in real, you know, rapid fire uh, way, could give us your parting thoughts. Uh, Dave, let's start with you and then we'll go Cynthia and to Todd. What do you want people to take away from, from this webinar uh, with respect to the state of 112? Yeah, I would just say that obviously there's, you know, a lot of case law surrounding it, and I think some of that case law could have been avoided if, you know, uh, the applicants and applicants' representatives were, were using a solution uh, like what we offer to, to avoid some of those issues, whether it's during prosecution or, or post, uh, post grant. So, um, you know, it's kind of a reiteration of what I was suggesting before, but uh, that would be my takeaway. Okay, thanks, Dave. Uh, sure. Cynthia. I'd say it's easy to, to feel really depressed by all of this, but we should really be trying to view this as an opportunity for meaningful conversation around how the patent's going to further a business objective, right? Very clearly, very concretely, what did you come up with? How is this helping you? And be very specific yeah. about that. You will run into, you know, 103 issues if you're if you're too narrow. How do you balance that with workarounds that are already out there? But but really think of this as an opportunity to have conversation between the attorney and the client, and and how this all fits into their business. Great, that's that's really good advice. I, I'm a big fan that and think that when the attorney and the client are really both working together and on the same page, that's when you get the best product anyway. <laughs> Todd, your final Yeah, point. I guess I yeah, I guess that's, that's sort of my takeaway as well. I think the takeaway for me and what I've tried to do is really work with clients to sit down and identify what all of the potential inventive aspects of an invention may be and then how uh, different ways or the best way or ways we can think of at the moment anyway to describe those uh, features as well as the benefits of what each of those features provide when I'm writing the specification. I think that's the opportunity I see to build kind of on what Cynthia was saying. We sit down with the client and really have a meaningful dialogue about those things. Yeah, I think that there's really no substitute for that. It is provided you have the client that's willing to participate with you. And unfortunately, sometimes that's, that's not the case. But when you when you have that, I think you really need to take advantage of it. And I guess you know, and this seems maybe maybe trite, but as attorneys, you know, we get so used to dealing with with the clients that have so much other stuff on their plate. They just want us to handle it all, and they don't really have time for us, and they don't even want to talk to us. And maybe my takeaway would be is maybe try not to be as cynical as an attorney, and and maybe don't assume that the next client won't want to participate, because I think. Today, the, the applications you work on where you really can get meaningful client participation are going to be so much better, and uh, it's going to make your life a lot easier if you can get that participation anyway in a meaningful way where you are the one driving the ship and they're the ones that are really conveying the information and letting you form the specification. 
So thank you guys for participating. Thank you, Alexis, Nexus, and Reed for, for sponsoring this. And we look forward to having you guys on uh, join us on another webinar here in the near future. We'll talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Gene.